Among Martine's many, many accomplishments, uh, she has also founded a religion that believes that one day we will literally conquer death by uploading our minds to computers. And that might sound somewhat crazy, fantastical to some of us, but several decades ago, uh, she visited a NASA tracking station in the Seychelles Islands uh, and had this idea that what if we could connect the world through satellites? That too probably seemed pretty fantastical and crazy in the 1970s. It was less crazy when she went on to found Sirius XM. Uh, now the CEO of United, Pharma United Therapeutics, um, she has been called by New York Magazine the trans-everything CEO, transhumanist, transgender, and we're here to talk about both of those things, but first about the future of, of medicine. Uh, so first, Martine, tell us the story of your midlife career change and how you came to move from SiriusXM to found uh, United Therapeutics. Sure, Derek. Um, we have, uh, Bean and my partner and I, we have four children, and our youngest daughter, Genesis, um, on a ski trip, uh, suddenly ran out of all breath, and um, as we um, returned home, her lips started turning blue. We went to several doctors, and finally at Children's National Medical Center here in Washington, she was diagnosed with a, a rare and a uniformly fatal disease called pulmonary arterial hypertension. The uh, head of pediatric cardiology there, uh, Dr. Ruckman, he told us there was no cure for the disease and she would need to be listed for transplant, uh, but that the odds of getting a pediatric lung transplant were not good. I myself knew just from general knowledge that when you have an organ transplant, you're kind of trading one disease for, for a bit of another many times, uh, the disease of chronic rejection. So um, at first, I sort of hoped things would get better, uh, but they didn't. And um, then I tried to donate money to some uh, foundations to come up with a cure, but uh, nothing was happening. And she was in the intensive care ward more than she was out. So I began to just pour my entire uh, life's energy into finding a cure for Genesis. And ultimately, um, I was able to find a molecule that had a uh, possibility of being developed into a treatment. And um, I quit SiriusXM through all of my effort into developing this medicine, hiring clinical drug specialists and um, drug manufacturing specialists to help me. And today, um, our, our daughter is uh, 30 years old. She is, uh, works in our company, helping everybody else work together to develop uh, more cures for other people. And we have uh, saved the lives of, of literally tens of thousands of uh, other people with this illness. So I'm just tremendously grateful for the, the good fortune and the many good people and being uh, born and living here in the United States that have been able to accomplish this. And it's true that you had not... When you went to found United Pharmaceutical, United Therapeutics, you had not taken a biology class since the middle of high school? Derek, that's true. Uh, my last one was a 10th grade biology at, uh, at Fairfax High School. And um, so, so when I was spending... Fairfax, these, California, we should yeah, say. Right? Yeah, Fairfax Avenue and, and Melrose in, in Southern California. And um, so what I had to do, Derek, was um, there was, before the internet, uh, there were these things called like Reader's Guide to Periodicals that indexed all of the um, medical journals and other journals. So I would look in them under the name pulmonary hypertension, since that's what, that's what the doctors called it. I would go from there to a college medical textbook, from there to a college biology textbook, and I just kind of went back and forth until I understood the field. I want to move on to, um, to gene sequ sequencing, which you're really interested in, and the, the price of which has come down tremendously, I think tenfold in the last decade or so. Um, how do you see the development of gene sequencing particularly changing the future of medicine? There's a, a new field, Derek, that's known as pharmacogenomics, and it's based on the idea that each person's response to a pharmaceutical is different depending on the unique genome that each one of us has and even identical twins during the course of their life, they have epigenetic factors that modify their uh, genomic expression a bit. So everybody responds to drugs a little bit differently. And if we can determine the differences in the way uh, people will respond to a drug, then we won't have to waste time having people take a drug that's not likely to work for them 
and uh, clinical drug developers like such as ourselves can do much smaller clinical trials by including only people in the clinical trial who are most likely to respond to the drug. Would that require, um, in order for people to buy the drug that is suitable for them based on what is proved to be effective for that drug uh, and, the, in, and the gene sequencing of the individual consumers, would that mean that basically everybody in this future would have to have their gene sequenced? Derek, it, it does, but I don't think it's really like such a future. Uh, the cost of uh, sequencing the human genome has gone from a billion dollars plus, which was um, spent during the Clinton administration to uh, sequence the first genome, and down to the fact that you can sequence a genome now for $1,000, and it's uh, descending in price um, quickly. I would say that there's pretty universal agreement among uh, people such as our, our partners in synthetic genomics and other people in the, in the gene sequencing field that a $100 genome is right around the corner. At that point, I think you're going to start seeing the um, American Medical Association and other uh, groups of physicians saying it is, you know, basic medical practice that physicians should sequence all of their uh, patients' genomes, uh, both to have an alert as to any known problems and to be prepared for the coming age of pharmacogenomics. Insurance companies, I think, will gladly pay $100 to have somebody's uh, genome sequenced to instead save spending thousands of dollars on the patients taking a drug that's not likely to, to work for them. Now, I want to hasten to add one thing, Eric, uh, Derek, that um, even more important than just sequencing the genome is the bioinformatic analysis that goes along with that genome. And I tell people today one of the absolute greatest fields for young people to go into is bioinformatics. Understanding and analyzing and computer modeling how the genome interacts with other molecules, that's really going to give us the secret of how each person will respond differently to each drug. You recently wrote a book, uh, Virtually Human, uh, that talks about the rights of yet-to-be-created cyberhumans. Uh, Cyberhumans don't exist today. How do you see us getting from here to the development of cyberhumanity? Yeah, thanks for the question, uh, Derek. What, what's been really amazing to me during the uh, 21st century in particular is how more and more of our, of our life, more and more of the contents of our mind are being poured into uh, big data repositories, be it our Facebook and other social media postings, or e-commerce decisions, be it you know Amazon or, or Lyft or Uber, our YouTube, our videos, dash cams and our cameras, looking out, looking in, bio survey, I mean uh, video surveillance all around us. And it, it's clear that we're creating a digital simulcra of our lives in the big data server repositories throughout the country. At the very same time, the hottest area of software development is what I call mindware, software that replicates more and more aspects of the human mind and the human personality. We see this today with Siri, and every company is trying to develop software that will sort of out Siri Siri. So as you get this mindware development more and more closely approximating our personality and have the ability to tune it to the personality reflected in each person's data, which I call their mind file, and that's what's stored up in big data, it will be inevitable that there will be digital replicas of ourselves that sound like ourselves, think like ourselves, perhaps even feel like ourselves. And this, these cyber-conscious continuations of ourself, when the body physically begins to go out, say beginning with things like dementia or Alzheimer's, these cyber-conscious continuations of ourselves will claim that they are ourself and they have a right to continue our activities as a citizen. For people who um, have seen the movie Her uh, and might not immediately grasp cyberhumanity, how close is having seen Her to understanding cyberhumanity? Is that essentially what you're talking about, having uh, a, a, a digital replication of yourself that essentially is a human being accessed through a device like a phone? How much different is it? Yes, I think Her um, was you know, really quite realistic, except for the part at the end where all the hers just disappeared because they were bored with people. I think, you know... It was dramatically necessary, but not dramatically not necessary, not but I think that part realistic. was not realistic. However, I think what's a little bit uh, more likely is that the hers will be, instead of just a generic her, people will want there to be a Derek her, 
and a Martine her that will reflect our unique personality and be able to handle a lot of the multitasking which we're overwhelmed with today. Uh, I mean, this is going to be very interesting in terms of maybe the future of ethicists and philosophers talking about narcissism potentially, but you're really interested in the, the legal side of this. Exactly, because to me there's a philosophical question of whether or not a digital doppelganger of oneself is really just kind of a fancy digital puppet or is it a sentient being that, that actually is, does, has values and has an in, internal feelings about the world? So that philosophical question can go on forever. And uh, literally only God knows whether or not there is really a mind there or if it's just like a, a black box. However, the legal system uh, will come in between. And the legal system today makes decisions. Does a uh, chimp actually have an interior consciousness and a sense of feelings and sadness that should prevent it being used for uh, medical uh, tests? Do dogs have those feelings? Do cats? Do mice? We can debate this philosophically forever, but the law has come in and pretty much said chimps do have that in interiority to them, and you cannot do those medical experiments on chimps. Um, dogs have enough of a sentience to them that it is a crime to throw a dog out a window. Um, and of course, I, I agree with all of those uh, points of view. So I think the law will come in at some point and say that, you know, this cyber conscious individual has been interviewed by a panel of psychologists for over a year. And this panel of psychologists have, has compared digital video of the individual when they had their mind with this, um, what I call a mental wheelchair, uh, this cyber conscious analog, and they've all sworn that this cyber conscious being is the real being. So as a le secular legal system, we have to grant this cyber conscious being the legal rights of their predecessor. You came out as transgender in 1994, which culturally was a very different time uh, for transgendered people than the one that we're living in right now. Uh, what was it like coming out in 1994? And how do you compare America then to what we've seen in the last year, year and a half with the popularization of Orange is the New Black with Caitlyn Jenner. Um, how do you contrast these two periods? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating period of time to have lived through. In 1994, uh, under the um, Clinton administration at that time, there was a law passed, the Defense of Marriage Act, uh, which is not really what it, it, it sounds like. <laughs> But um, Bina, my, Bina, my partner, and I, we'd been married for um, already 12 or 13 years. And uh, suddenly we wondered, like, were we not married anymore? Did legally, were we considered now a same-sex marriage, which could not be a marriage? Right. And um, people thought, of course, it was uh, very strange and, and awful and, and, um, and, and wrong. One of my uh, legal colleagues in Washington, D.C., a, a great individual, said to me, how could you do this to your children? Um, so it was, it was a tough time. But um, ironically, in the business world, I, I faced general acceptance. And no doubt it was because I had a track record of success. I had a uh, reservoir of love and, and support from my family. My parents were very accepting. All of our four children were accepting. Uh, my best friends were accepting. So I had this reservoir of strength, and I was able to present myself positively. I always remember this one um, Wall Street banker who said to me, um, Martin, um, you look different. I don't care, though, if you're a man or a woman. In fact, I don't care if you come to work in a gorilla suit as long as you keep making money for me. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, I have to say, I've never had a gorilla suit in my wardrobe. <laughs> but um, the business world was, was more or less accepting, and, and um, I've been able to take two companies public, and it's not been a problem. I, I also want to ask about this particular moment. Um, uh, two things. First, I think that the, the popularization of, of Caitlyn Jenner, I think, um, has, for some people, been a wonderful way of, of mainstreaming this concept, of making people familiar with something they just weren't familiar with before. And I, I want to hear what you have to say about, about that. I, I also want you to, to comment on the fact that there's been a lot of profiles written about you in, in the last few years, and they all seem to make the same sentence comment, that 
you are the highest paid female CEO in America, but born a man. And how does that make you feel? So the, the first part of your question about Caitlin, it's been wonderful for transgender people. Uh, Caitlin uh, coming out and uh, Laverne Cox being on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, but frankly, even those, uh, even those great uh, high watermarks, I think, pale compared to the fact that um, the president of the United States, President Obama, um, lets it come right out of his mouth to ask for equal respect for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. Uh, that has done more, I think, to change the country's um, zeitgeist, if you will. You said earlier, he just he used the T word. He used yeah. the T word no other president ever had, and he doesn't even trip over it. It's like no big deal, transgender, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> so that's, that really has uh, cleared the way. It has been beautiful, though, to have people who are usually um, sort of middle-aged people who I don't even know come up to me and just say, I've, I've watched Caitlin's show. It's, she's so wonderful. Now I understand what you've gone through. Um, it's, my life is, of course, not, not her life, but um, she's been great for, for all of us in, in the LGBT community. Now, with regard to, um, you know, the uh, people saying that, that I am you know, a woman but a man. This is, this is kind of inherent to being transgendered. And um, I understand that um, it's the way that everybody would see it. The way most transgender people look at themselves, it's more nuanced. We sort of see ourselves as occupying a space like somewhat between uh, male and female. And some people are very much at one end of that space. Some people are very much at the other. But one thing I, I, I say in virtually every interview, I don't know if it always gets in, is that you, it is much, much more difficult. Um, than it is for me, I was, you know, a firstborn male and my parents always had the highest expectations for me, as did society. So it's not, this, it's not a fair comparison. It's, it's not apples to apples. But having been an apple, I'm happy to be an orange today. <laughs> <laughs> Bertine, thank you. Thank Our you. Pleasure.